السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We always praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household, all his companions, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of them and to grant every one of us the blessings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our offspring, those to come up to the end of time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us all steadfast. Brothers and sisters in Islam, a beautiful evening in this beautiful country, the United Arab Emirates, in the beautiful city of Dubai. Beautiful venue with beautiful brothers and sisters. Every one of us is productive. That's why we are here, mashallah. If we had no productivity in us, we would still have been sleeping back at home, mashallah. And there might be other productive people listening to us online by the will of Allah. They too have some form of productivity which we need to acknowledge. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making us people who really can use our time wisely. This evening, you know, we are speaking of a productive Muslim. Firstly, the Muslim part of it is extremely important because that is what will guide the productivity. If a person does not have in them that Islam, then perhaps their productivity might not be of benefit to the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and perhaps it might have a totally different impact on humankind at large. So we thank Allah for being Muslim, who are surrenderers to the word of Allah. And this is why it's important for me to start off by reminding myself and yourselves that the root of the productivity of a Muslim lies in his or her link with his maker or her maker. If you have no link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do you expect that productivity of yours or the capacity, the ability that Allah has given you to be used in the right channel? How do you expect your intention for doing something or using the capacity you have the intention behind it to be correct when we don't even have the basics which is the link with our own maker or the ability or readiness to surrender to the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This is why when we call ourselves Muslim, we should be ashamed if we do not surrender because we would be lying. We would be telling a lie. A man says, I'm a Muslim. Muslim means al-istislamu lillah. Someone who surrenders to Allah and he's not productive enough to get up for Salatul Fajr. He's not productive enough to go to the masjid for Salah, for example. So can he really say, I have surrendered to Allah? Let's be honest. Can someone who's not prepared to adopt the commands of Allah at all, say that I am a surrenderer to the law of Allah or to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the reason why we start off with this is, there is room for improvement in my life and in yours. And by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can all do better in this regard. Every one of us, no matter how close we seem we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can become even closer. And the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, He says to us in a hadith Qudsi, whoever comes to me, a hand span, I come to him an entire foot. Whoever comes to me walking, I come to him rushing and so on. This is because whatever you have used your energies towards, normally you achieve a result. And if you use it towards going to Allah, you will achieve such a great result that your maker will come closer to you than, you, your, than your attempt to get close to him. So what you need and I need is the attempt, the correct attempt by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to fulfill that. So we ask the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people who can develop this link at all times. A very important point also is the link we have with Allah is always polished up through tawbah, through repentance. We as human beings, we falter, we err, we make mistakes. We say things sometimes that we may not be proud of or we do things that we believe we could have done better. So a way to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that each one of us needs to constantly repent or ask his forgiveness. Not just thinking that I did not commit a major sin, so I don't need to repent. But repenting and asking Allah forgiveness for that which we know and that which we don't know. Believe me, 
it increases the link with Allah and therefore it makes us utilize the energies we have been given by Allah, the capacities, the different gifts that we have been granted by Allah. It makes us utilize them in a way that they, we become of benefit to all those around us in a beautiful way. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us ease. You know, the brothers were telling me that you have to say something uh, on a lighter note because you know the crowd is quite big. Mashallah, we have a capacity crowd. Some people might still be coming and so on. So I was telling him, my brother, you know what? We are going to be speaking of something productive. So by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's going to be more serious. He says, no, no, no. You need to make sure that you raise a point that will make the people think you know, in a positive way, but getting the message across in a lighter way. You know, moments ago he said, in his own style, talking about me, in his own way. The truth of the matter is to reach out to the young and the old. Sometimes we use examples that really would remain in your mind. And that example that remains in your mind, the point that is derived from it is what is of essence. So let me give you a quick example, productivity. Because I started off by telling you that if a person cannot come for salah, can he then claim the link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, say he is a surrenderer, the most productive thing you could ever do is to worship Allah. The most productive thing you could do is to fulfill your salah on time. It is an automatic way of making you a professional leader. You have the time management close at hand, done automatically by your maker before sunrise you are up. So your laziness is out because laziness and productivity do not come together. Laziness and productivity will definitely never see eye to eye. So if a person cannot give up his laziness or hers with the bare minimum of fulfilling salah or fulfilling the duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what does he or she expect? So let's get to the story of a man. And it's a true story. This man comes in for Salatul Fajr after he heard a powerful talk of someone and he felt, you know what, let me get to Salah at least. So he got up early in the morning. Inshallah, I hope we all get up early morning tomorrow and we will be there for Salatul Fajr. Will we? Brilliant, Inshallah. May Allah make it easy for us. Remember, don't just say Inshallah. You know, sometimes when someone tells you, are you coming tomorrow? They say Inshallah. Inshallah means, mm, I'll see about it. Don't do that. Say, yes, Inshallah. By the will of Allah, we will be there and make an effort to get there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. A point that came to mind, this evening people gathered here from 6 o'clock, yet the talk was scheduled for 7.30 for 8. Do you know that? And this talk is not as important as your Salatul Fajr. That's what I want to raise to you. Salatul Fajr is far more valuable, but this is also important because it will motivate you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point being raised is, can't we get to Salah 5 minutes before the Adhan? Or five minutes before the jama'ah, before the congregational prayer. Why is it that we are rushing late? Even though we might be people who go for salah, but our productivity is on a negative because we are rushing every time. If you look back, you'll see the same people who are late. They are the late for all these salawat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from those. And may He not make us from those who turn around to watch who is late. You might say, how do you know? Well, subhanallah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this young man comes up for Salatul Fajr and the Imam is reading Surah Al-Baqarah. Now Surah Al-Baqarah, you know, uh, what is the meaning of Baqarah? The cow. And he's reading a long Surah and this young man is standing behind and he's really, he's waiting and he's listening and he doesn't understand much. And this is why part of productivity is to make sure you understand the word of Allah. Part of productivity is to make sure you understand the will of Allah. Go and get it. You know, we need to be go-getters. That's a word that is used nowadays. You go and get it. You make sure you do not sit back. You need to be a go-getter if you'd like to achieve. Which means, you talk about something, do not rest until it is done. So, when we say the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can I ask a question here? How many of us have read the meanings of the Quran in a language we understand from cover to cover? Please put up your hand. We can do better, can't we? We can do better. The word of your maker, the one who made you, he gave you such a beautiful life. 
He gave you such brilliant weather in such a lovely country. So beautiful family members and so much of wealth and so much of food and so on. And you have not yet read why he made you from his own kalam, from his own word. Surely we can do better. And by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't just nod your head. We need to say, yes, tonight I'm going to get a Quran. Whether it's the Sahih International, which is the simplest English translation you can ever read. Or another book of tafsir and so on. And I'm going to start today reading one ayah, one verse or two verses a day. If you do that, you will complete at least. That's a bare minimum. If you don't, this is what happens. You come for salah, the imam is reading some beautiful verses. أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ What a powerful reminder where Allah is saying, has the time not come for the believers, for their hearts to soften up towards the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what was revealed from the truth. And yet we don't know what it means. So we're busy saying, when is this imam going to finish? <laughs> Wallahi, it's a reality. When is this imam going to finish? But that's the word of Allah. What an insult. What an insult. It is more beautiful than my word and yours. I can never ever think that of the word of Allah. The problem is I don't know the meaning. I have not made an effort to learn the meaning. So this man comes and he's listening to Surah Al-Baqarah in Salatul Fajr. And he really feels this is taking so long. And this is one of my first salawat. May Allah protect us all. Grant us goodness. So after the salah, he nudges the brother next to him. He says, hey, that was long. What surah was this man? Meaning what did the imam read? He says, this was Surah Al-Baqarah. It is known as the cow. It is the longest surah in the Quran. Wow. So this young man says, okay, okay. So now when I come for salah, I'm going to have to ask which surah is being read before I join. Look at this. Where is the productivity? If we are not productive, we lose completely. So the man arrives at Salat Al-Maghrib. And he, the imam starts, أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ You know the meaning of that surah? So he asks the brother, hey, what surah is this? He says, it is the elephant. He says, whoa, if Baqarah was so big, I'm going away. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Baqarah was such a long surah, feel must be. A... So he says, brother, this is your negative thought. This is one of the shortest surahs in the Quran. So the point being raised here is, how can we be productive when firstly, we treat the salah, which is the most important link between us and Allah with so much of negativity. And secondly, we come to the wrong conclusions based on the wrong principle we have in life. So if you have a wrong principle in life, and if you are living only for the sake of this life, you will never be able to be productive as a Muslim. You might be productive in the world, you've achieved so much, but you forgot to produce for your akhirah. This is why if you look at the, one of the best du'as in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the du'a informs us of the importance of this worldly life and how important it is to be a successful person who has happiness in the dunya. That can only come with, with the discipline of Islam, with the discipline of the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ From amongst the people there are some who ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Oh Allah grant us in this dunya, but they don't have a portion of the akhirah, of the life after death. Grant us in this world. They only make dua for this world. Ya Allah, I need the job. Ya Allah, I need the health. Ya Allah, I need the wealth. Ya Allah, I need a spouse. Ya Allah, I need... This, I need a car, I need a house, I need an increase, I need a salary, I need what? I need good health and so on. All these du'as are good, but what du'a did you make for the life after death? You will get your promotion, you will get your wealth, you will have your car, you will have your health, you will have a spouse, you will have children. May Allah grant that to us. But did you ever think that one day you have to leave all of that? What this would mean is your expertise that Allah gave you, the ability to produce, mashallah, to be productive by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have utilized all of that to build an empire for yourself, to be able to be happy and smile and look at everything and press a remote, your garage opens, press a remote, your car opens, press a remote, the car starts. Look at the kettle in the kitchen and it starts. Grrr. 
Imagine, today you can look at something and it starts operating. I'm sure a lot of you have the phones where you look at it and it scrolls down. You look away and the video stops. You see how it's working. So all this is part of the dunya. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ From amongst them, they are those who rightly call out to Allah, saying, O oh Allah, grant us the goodness in the dunya. Goodness meaning the success and the happiness and all that which comes with this beautiful world that Allah has created for us. Grant us the success in the dunya and grant us the goodness of the life after death as well. So it is a balance. And on top of that, another dua to say, and save us from the punishment of the fire. So we believe. That is why we say, save us from the punishment of the fire. There are people out there who do not believe in the life after death. They do not believe that there will be Jannah or Jahannam, paradise or hellfire. So they do not ask Allah for paradise, nor do they ask Allah for protection from hellfire because they don't believe. And sometimes we believe, but we forget to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, when you have a beautiful vehicle or a car or a house or anything of that nature, conveyance, something nice, a watch or perhaps a mobile phone, anything, ask Allah, Ya Allah, grant me Jannah. Ya Allah, grant me paradise. Ya Allah, this thing here is temporary. This apparatus, this tool I have is your gift to me to facilitate the short life that I have in this world. Yes, I will contribute as best as I can for the rest of humanity to be able to live a comfortable life, but with the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Ya Allah, grant me paradise so that I can enjoy whatever is there in the paradise. May Allah grant it to us. So this attitude needs to improve. The way we treat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not be with laziness. It should not be as though I have a choice about it. In Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَارَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ It is not befitting or it is not for a believing male or female that when Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have declared something that he or she feels that I have a choice about it. A true believer believes I don't have a choice. It is Allah. He has decided this and I will do it. If my weakness makes me dilly-dally, I need to make sure I repent and as soon as I can, I need to get back on track. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who understand this. So brothers and sisters, we have productivity. Firstly, with our link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be productive by the will of Allah. Then the link with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have a problem. What is the problem? A lot of us say, I love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When someone says Muhammad, we are quick to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, that is an instruction. Man salla alayya wahidatan sallallahu alayhi biha ashra. Whoever sends blessings upon me, once Allah sends blessings upon him tenfold. So if I want blessings or you want blessings, male or female, you need to send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you receive this reward. So part of productivity is to engage in this type of salah ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But that is not the sole link with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we say la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what we need to realize is we have declared that there is no deity, no one worthy of worship besides Allah. So I will not worship my wealth, my position, the people around me, the sticks, the stones, whatever else there is in terms of this material life and anything that is created. I will never worship it. Worship Allah alone. That is the most productive way of looking at la ilaha illallah and it is the way of looking at it. Whatever Allah says, I surrender. That's me. That's why I call myself a surrenderer, Muslim. When it comes to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I bear witness that Muhammad, may peace be upon him, is the messenger. The one who has carried the message from the creator and brought it to me in such a way that I'm reading it. There is no doubt. This book, Allah says, and definitely there is no doubt 
In it, there is guidance for those who have taqwa, who are conscious of their maker. You want guidance from the Quran, you need to be a person who's conscious of your maker. You are not conscious of your maker, you will not be able to be productive with your link with the Quran. Nor will you be able to benefit. And a person who does not want to benefit from the Quran, there is something wrong with their level of taqwa and the consciousness of Allah. So if for example, we take a look at the Quran, we read it and it, we recite it so much, it does not affect us. There is something wrong with our belief in Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the word of Allah. Today, people can cheaply, very cheaply, become so heavily affected by a small word which is uttered by a person of the opposite sex whom they are in love with who doesn't even know them, for example, sometimes. And they go crazy. Look at how people go crazy with the pop stars and so on across the globe. Whereas, when it comes to the word of Allah, we are not even one-tenth as crazy. Not one-tenth as crazy. It doesn't affect us. When Allah says, you want success, you need to believe and do good deeds. That's how you will achieve success. And we think otherwise. We think no man. But when someone else, one of the people of the globe, who has seen a little bit of glamour and glitter, when we look at them and we see the type of life they are living, they become our icons and our role models. That is one of the most destructive things because their lives in most cases are full of depression and full of lack of that happiness and contentment. You know, I've had the opportunity to meet with a few film stars. And if you look at them in real life, they will confess to you that my life is a mess. A mess. And yet people want to dress like them, they want to be like them. So what will happen? As a result of all that, your life also becomes a mess. Allahu Akbar. Why? Because you are following someone whose example has led to their real life being a mess. What they do on the screen is something else. What happens in real life, they are not productive. They have perhaps produced, but because they don't have the deen, that production is not, as I said, focused upon the contentment of the dunya and the akhirah. So therefore, they cannot be the perfect example. But Allah says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Indeed, we have a shining example to emulate in that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. In the person of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, a beautiful example, the way he did business, the way he treated his spouse, his family members, the people, the Muslims, the non-Muslims, the, how forgiving he was, how kind he was, his beautiful words, how he spoke, how he walked, how he talked. Every single thing is at the peak of excellence. If only we are productive enough to go through the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many of us, and another question and I'd like to see by a show of hands inshallah. How many of us have read a detailed biography of the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from cover to cover? Yes, put up your hand. We can do better by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can do better. My brothers and sisters... To say we can do better is an acknowledgement of what we've done. But an encouragement to say, let us produce, let us have better results by the will of Allah. Why do we just say, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but what about his life? I don't know. What about his example? I don't know. You are the one who's screaming at home to your spouse. You are never there for your children. How can you say, I believe in Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam only by tongue, but his example means nothing to you. Yet he was the most productive. So productive he was that without internet, without even a microphone, the whole world changed. Subhanallah. That's how productive he was. By the will of Allah, obviously, the help is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was a Nabi, the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the point being raised is of utmost importance that that shining example, we have not yet seen it yet. The most successful human being to exist was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without a doubt. You know, people say, oh, this guy's got 1.5 million followers on Facebook. Oh, that guy's got 10 million followers. Big deal. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has got two and a half billion likes. How's that? Did he have internet? No. Allahu Akbar. Did he have a loud hailer? No. So what happened? That was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him success. But our problem is we have not yet read through the pages of how that success was achieved. That's the problem. And it's not enough to just read through the pages. But my genuineness with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam should make me so productive that I become an asset to everyone around me. I touch them with 
something just the mere fact that I've been in their presence for a few minutes I need to touch them how many of you when you are with someone and you pass them or you see them once in your life and the way your interaction has been you've left a mark well if we were proper Muslims perhaps we would have left that mark may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us we would be more conscious of leaving a mark and you cannot leave a good mark if the only marks you have in your own life are not good so if I want to leave a good mark good impression it's not just an impression to impress no but what we mean is a good example something worth remembering people look at Islam today and they have this animosity against Islam they don't understand they don't realize and sometimes it's our own doing because the way we behave you know you see a non-muslim and you just that's it walk the other way no they are sometimes so productive but they lack the deen if they had the deen in them they would have been productive in both ways and been ultimately successful what we can do is the minimum take a page from their lives to see the productivity in their lives how they achieved top positions how they've achieved so much success in terms of the dunya take a page from it believe me it comes with discipline if you are not disciplined or focused and you do not have a goal and an objective you cannot be productive our objective is paradise but at the same time we'd like to live a life where we can live comfortably and together with that we can prepare for the generations to come to be good members of the ummah that's the preparation the difficulty is with us we tend to forget what our objective is so the objective becomes very watered down sometimes or deep down at the back of our minds we know that okay I'm a Muslim I need Jannah but right now I need a million dinars that's a minor issue to be honest with you if you had Jannah without the million dinars you are more successful than if you had two million dinars without the Jannah Do you understand so the balance we're talking about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if we take a look at his entire life and we learn it and we make it our business to consider him the Nabi of Allah in the true sense where when he has said something we adopt we understand we relate then inshallah we will become the best of people and we will be able inshallah to produce we will be able to be people who can by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala achieve success in the dunya as well as in the akhirah my brothers and sisters we are so fortunate that we have been granted the chance to enjoy the dunya imagine if Allah told us that look you believe in me I made you you're not allowed to wear these clothings and, and have anything else to do with luxury you just need to be in prayer for your whole life imagine if that was a ruling and we had to stand in salah the whole day and the whole night what would happen so Allah says no discipline is brought about through obeying the command of Allah because discipline is the prime component of achievement anyone in this world who has achieved I'm talking of worldly achievement they can never have done so without discipline they need to be strict they need to be following rules and regulations you tell me doesn't Islam have the most rules and regulations sometimes people say Islam is tough the truth is it's not tough it's people who are not prepared to be disciplined they just want to do as they please so if we do as we please the productivity will not be holistic it might be you know just a small department of achievement that's all small portion of it but the minute we have the entire component we have good achievement by the will of Allah like we say discipline so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us in a way that we need to be productive even with our family members imagine we spoke about Allah we spoke about Rasulullah sallallahu and then we have the family members how do we treat them how do we touch their lives how do we invest in them when we have children children are an investment for our dunya and the akhirah amazing you know one day I was sitting with a man and he told me we got chatting non-muslim and we got chatting and we're talking about all sorts of things and so on and then he tells me so uh, how many children do you have I told him I have seven he said what seven seven kids are you crazy how are you gonna afford that that's a question because it's looked at from a different angle altogether sometimes people who do not have iman look at children as an expense how am I going to afford it 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained this in the Quran in a beautiful way. But I said, you know what? If I said, why is it considered an expense? He said, how are you going to pay fees? I said, that's all temporary. It's just for a few years. After that, you know what happens? Each one of them will have a salary of 100,000 and I'm going to be a rich man. I've got more kids than yours. So I'll be having 700,000 before you know it. And if your kids say, for example, one is still searching for a job. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen. So anyway, I just made it sound that way. But the point I was trying to get across is for us, it's a huge investment. Not only for the dunya, but more so for the akhirah. Tazawwaju al-waduda al-walud. Fa'inni mubahim bikum al-umam yawm al-qiyamah. It's something of the Prophet sallallahu teachings to 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 want more children or as many as you can bring up properly. You know, obviously there, there are teachings of Islam in this regard which are detailed, which I'm not going to go into because it's not part of the topic. But we need to bring up our children with a lot of discipline and with goodness, with character. This afternoon we spoke, or should I say this morning, we had a parental workshop here. And mashallah, we managed to meet quite a few parents and we discussed this topic at length. But by the will of Allah, if we know that every child that reads salah because of our encouragement, even after we die, we will be receiving a reward for that particular child's productivity. Imagine. Your child, you've given them such an upbringing that they make dua, they pray for you after you've died. The hadith says, إِذَا مَا تَبْنُ آدَمَ قَطَ عَنْهُ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ if a, if a person, a human being dies, all his deeds are cut off from him besides three things. What are these three things? One is knowledge that he may have disseminated. Two is a charitable deed that is a continued charity that he may have given somehow benefiting others. This is productivity. To learn is productivity, but more productive than learning is to put into practice and disseminate. That's why in Islam, it's not only ilm, but it's ilmun wa amal, wa da'wa. You need to learn, you need to put into practice, and you need to call others towards it. Convey the message. Allahu Akbar, I always tell the sisters, you know, when you go to a home, and you find, mashallah, this cake was beautiful. So you know, sometimes a man might come back, and he might say, Hey, I went to this house of my friend and you know, there was a lovely cake. So uh, let's not get into negatives, but let's be positive inshallah. So uh, lovely cake. So the wife says, okay, she messages the, 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 the sister there and says, my husband says the cake was very nice. What is the recipe? A lot of women will say, it's my secret. <laughs> it's a secret. Where is productivity? You might die tomorrow morning. Your cake is gone with you. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. You'd rather write your name on it and say, this is a beautiful cake. I tried 20 different cakes. This thing came out. Here's the ingredient and so on. You bake it in the sun, not in the oven. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and then if you had died, people will make the cake later. They'll remember you. But imagine that issue that's being dealt with is not a cake. But it is something developing your link with Allah. When you die, they won't only remember you. You get a reward for it. Whatever they do. And when they make a dua for you, you get a reward for it. So these type of things are what will benefit. And one of the points I was raising, and that's why I raised the hadith, is a child who prays for you after you've died. How will that child pray for you when you have not been of any positive impact upon your own children? Father, you were never at home. Where were you? I was at work all day, every day. So my child was brought up by whom? I don't even know. You know, we say to bring up is different from to grow like wild grass. You know, if you put water on soil that is fertile, it will grow anything, weeds or whatever. But if you sow seeds and then put water, you can have a fruit tree. You can have something else. So water can be beneficial if only you've sown the seeds. The same applies. You have children, mashallah. To be able to make them productive in the right sense, you need to engage in their lives. That is productivity. If I do not take part in the lives of my children, I'm not a productive Muslim. Because Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Allahu Akbar. Oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your family members from the fire. That's a Muslim. So if I understand this and I believe it, and I work towards it. I'm so productive that the day I die, not only will I be saved, but, but my children will have direction by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah grant us goodness. Then we have the workplace. All of us, majority of us, we work. 
Some of us are self-employed. Some of us are employed by others. Some might be looking for jobs. May Allah make it easy for you to find a good job. I mean. You see, the Amin was soft, meaning a lot of us have jobs. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, the reality is, at the workplace, are you a dedicated Muslim? You know, we have doctors, lawyers, accountants, and so many people. One is to have a doctor who is a Muslim. And the other is to have a Muslim doctor. There is a difference between the two. Why? One, he is conscious of his Islam. And he is conscious of leaving that Islam in the hearts of everyone he interacts with or she interacts with. Conscious of it. And the other is a professional who is trying to hide the fact that they are Muslim. But they are Muslim. Allahu Akbar. Big difference between the two. You want to be a productive Muslim, do not shy away from being Islamic. Your name is Abdul Aziz, say it is Abdul Aziz. Do not say it is Zizi. <laughs> it's a reality. May Allah protect us. That's just one example. There are so many different examples. If you are proud of your Islamic identity, automatically you are part of being a productive Muslim. You've already started the stage. Why? Because... All of us have a capacity. Every one of us has a gift from Allah. Some have recognized their gifts and some haven't. All of us have the capacity to contribute. And we are contributing. Every one of us. Every one of you is a shepherd. And each one of you is responsible for his or her flock. So we've all been given some form of leadership. Some form of gift from Allah. We have energies, we have capacities. Why do we need to use those capacities without confirming our Islam and without confirming the fact that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are Muslim? You are going to work anyway. Whether you're a Muslim, whether you portray you're a Muslim or not, you're still going to work. If you would like to develop your link with Allah, just make sure that they know you're a good Muslim. Amazing. Amazing. And being a good Muslim does not mean you pick a fight with people. It does not mean that you need to be harsh. No, that in fact is a warped interpretation of Islam. We are supposed to reach out to people. Like we say, every non-Muslim is a potential Muslim. Potential Muslim. May Allah grant us the ability to touch the hearts in a way that when He guides them, He makes us a means to at least have touched them. Your character, if you are honest and upright at your workplace, you don't flirt as the others flirt. And people know this man is so good. He's such a professional. He is brilliant in every way. And you know what? He's upright. No flirting, no bad, you know, no bad habits and so on. Such a good person. The non-Muslims will be making dua to say, Ya Allah, give us a husband like this. They'll be making dua in their own way. They will be praying in their own way to say, we want a brilliant husband. I know of people who will say that we want an upright Muslim as a husband. And they're not Muslim. I actually have a few examples. People have told me that. And you say, why? Because they don't drink, they don't have bad habits. And I say, oh, alhamdulillah, at least you've seen the right side of us. <laughs> alhamdulillah. May Allah grant us goodness. So people gauge or judge Islam based on us. People judge Islam based on us. And we need not shy away from Islam and its teachings because that's what people need. A lot of the times people later on in life will tell you, you know what, I appreciate the fact that you were a little bit hard or I appreciate the fact that you were a little bit blunt because I have learned a lesson from it. We've saved hundreds or thousands by the will of Allah. Why? Because we were not shy of our Islamic identity. To be shy of your Islamic identity reduces your productivity. You cannot claim to be a productive Muslim and you will not be able to be a truly productive Muslim if you shy away from that Muslim part of the term productive Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So the workplace, all of us, let's better our attitude. Let's become disciplined. You are on time. Why? As a Muslim, it should be so easy for you to come. If your work kicks off at 8, 5 to 8, the Muslims are there. Why? Because you read your salah. I can be disciplined for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by never missing a single salah five times a day. Work, I only have to go there once a day. Why can't I arrive on time at least? But today they tell you, you know what, he's a Muslim, oh, eight o'clock. he probably come by about nine, he might be here. Is that the attitude? I hope not in this country. But in some places that is the attitude. They tell you this is Indian mean time. You say, I've never heard of that. What does that mean? That means the time is mean. 
What does that mean? That means it's very bad. You know, mean means mean, you know. So they say that means bad timing. If they tell you 8 o'clock, perhaps at 9 they'll phone you and say, I'm running a bit late, brother. Come on, man. Come on. Is that a productive Muslim? If you give someone a word, be there in advance. If you're going to be delayed, well before the timing, inform them, listen, we will be slightly delayed by the will of Allah. Do you know I was told this evening's talk will start off at 8? We started at 5 to 8? That's Emirates time, mashallah. When Emirates lands, they tell you we are 5 minutes ahead of schedule. Well, that's what we did today. By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason I say this, that productivity reaches so far and it really impacts the people's lives that we don't realize these small pieces of discipline that we achieve through spirituality should help us to become professional. When you do something, do it properly. This evening, mashallah, look at this venue as packed as it is. But look at the facility. Look at how beautifully it was done with what excellence considering the place, the time, and whatever other facilities we've had to make use of, the organizers have done a splendid job. Subhanallah. May Allah bless them. They are productive Muslims by the will of Allah. If it wasn't for that productivity, I think people across the globe would not be listening to us now. About 15 minutes before we started already, the brother was telling me there are 500 people watching from overseas. Subhanallah. Right now, I don't even know. What? If we were not productive Muslims and did not think of that, what would happen? We would not be able to touch the maximum. Yet, the, the opportunity is one. Your opportunity is now. I don't know if I'm going to get another opportunity to speak to you. So, I better reach out to as many as possible. But the organizers have thought of this. This might be you know, a function that might touch someone somewhere, somehow. Let's get to as many people as possible. That is productivity. This forward thinking. By the will of Allah. This is part of our work. Then we have productivity. The house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What have you contributed towards the masjid in your area? The minimum contribution is to attend for salah. Did you know that? The minimum contribution. Which is actually not a contribution but it is a gift for you. Call it a contribution today. Is for you to attend. The house of Allah calls you. Look mashallah as I'm sitting here. As I'm standing, I can see so many of these minaras, ma'adhin, so many of them here. Amazing how some of us never go there, except if it's a Jumu'ah. What's the productivity? What did you give the masjid of your area? It's the house of Allah. When you get into your grave, your link with the house of Allah is going to help you because the hadith says, رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّكٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ a person whose heart is always hanging in the masjid, he always wants to go back to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always concerned about his prayer, always concerned about the timing of the prayer and so on. That person will have a special shade on the day of judgment. Amazing. This is productivity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. When there is a charitable cause, how many of us can reach out meaningfully? Meaningfully. To be productive does not just mean to give a charity. Look where you are giving it. Who are you giving it to? Are they responsible people? Will they fulfill it? Will they get it to where it is supposed to get to? And so on. So many things are to be considered. That is part of productivity. If I've got wealth, it's easy for me to give. But it's not easy for me to give the right people. It's not easy for me to reach the right people sometimes. It will be a little bit more of an effort to find the right people and give it to them. That is part of productivity, to make the effort to try your best. Make the effort to try and get it to the right people at the right time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goodness. And this is why we say, your choice of friends and the people you mix with plays such a big role in how productive you are going to be. Some people get together, the only thing they like is to watch. What are you watching? Cricket. What else? Football. What else? The movies. What else? Well... This thing and that thing, golf, golf subhanAllah has become a big thing. So if that is the only thing you are doing, then believe me, you need, your company needs a little bit of adjustment. Because life is not all about golf. You know when the angel asks you uh, questions, you can't say, oh I played 18 holes off par. I played 18 holes off par. That's not going to help. That was just part of your amusement in the dunya. We're not saying it's wrong, for example, to have a game of golf. But... To give it preference over your deen is definitely wrong. To forget about the fact that you might die on the golf course. And we've had people who have, who, whom that has happened to. 
Then what will happen? Nobody's going to say he used to use the ping club. You know the club? Ping, P-I-N-G. Wow, nice club. Used by people. Top people. Nobody's going to ask you that. So we need to direct a little bit. Whilst we are amusing ourselves in the dunya, life is not all about entertainment alone. No. The most or the people who are most at loss as Muslimin are those who think life is all about partying. Come Friday night, we're out in the party. Come Friday night, we go out every Friday. What do we do? We party until the early morning when the people are going for Fajr. And you know what we are doing? We're heading in the other direction. People are going for Fajr and we're going back to bed whilst the prayer is being called towards and we are heading in another direction. If that is our life and we've reduced it to partying and enjoying every weekend, where is the productivity? We've lost focus. Sometimes the new generation gets so involved in movies and so involved in entertainment that they feel without thinking their life is all about entertainment, partying, all day. Everything is about a party at this house and that house and next week we're going to meet at this house. Where are the halakat? Where is something that you've done for your deen? Why don't you choose some weekends to come out to a talk like this? As a family for example. Or go and mobilize. Go and get people. Get someone to talk to you. Not everyone is going to be able to talk to you on a certain level. But at least share what you have. Get some recitation of Quran. Get a little teacher. Get someone to explain to you one verse of the Quran. It doesn't need to be so long. Because nowadays what we've noticed. When you prolong something to do with spirituality and religion. People become a little bit put off. So if I were to talk to you for one hour, perhaps you would listen. The minute I stretch it to the next hour, we'll start finding people stretching their hands. You know, we'll find people yawning and they do it purposely, you know. In one lecture, I told the brothers and the sisters that I will end the talk when I see the first person yawning. So immediately I said, please don't yawn intentionally. <laughs> but mashallah, I didn't find any of that yawning. But I thought to myself, if someone wants to stop me, they just gotta go, ah, you know, and it's over. I'll say, thank you, he's yawning, I'm gone. But productivity is that we don't bore people with things. Don't make them bored. Say something that is relevant. Say something that will benefit them. Keep them on their toes. You know, this is why the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, ma qalla wa kafa khayrun mimma kathura wa alha. That which is short to the point is better than that which is much more and it distracts you. So if you go home and someone asks you, how was the talk? You say, powerful. But how was it? Powerful. What did he say? Power packed. <laughs> so what's happening? Ah, power. Mashallah. Product Muslim. That's all you remember. Productive Muslim. The most productive thing was the word powerful. Allahu Akbar. If that's the case, we achieve nothing. So the best thing to do is speak short. Say something good. The reason I say this is, we sometimes cause people to lose productivity because we bore them when they had a good intention to come out to do something and we just kept them sitting, kept them that way. You, when we do not utilize the energies of the youth, we bore them into lack of productivity. We actually boot them out into oblivion. The youth have a lot of energy. Use them for something. Mobilize them. Get them used in something constructive because if not, they will start partying because for them, that's the past time. They have nothing better to do. Why? Nobody allowed them to do something. Let them get together. Let them organize perhaps some food for an orphanage. Perhaps a little bit of old clothes to send somewhere to a country. Or maybe a little bit of aid to send to someone who's struggling across the globe. Let them mobilize it and do it on their own in a beautiful way. Play a little role in their lives. These are the youngsters. The, perhaps the children and those who are growing up. So from that young age, we've already taught them productivity. Use your time wisely. نِعْمَتَانِ مَغْبُونٌ فِيهِمَا كَثِيرٌ مِّنَ النَّاسِ الصِّحَّةُ وَالْفَرَاغِ The Prophet ﷺ says, two gifts of Allah. Many people are deceived regarding them. What are these two gifts? Your health. Whilst you have it, be productive, use it. There will come a day when you won't have it. That is there. So whilst you can fulfill your salah, whilst you can use that energy to reach out to as many people as you can in the most positive way. The minute we don't Remember, or the minute we become oblivious of the fact that the health is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what will happen is we lose productivity. The same applies to your time, your free time. If you're not going to utilize it, believe me, I know of some people who are so productive that every minute they get, they are doing something to reach out to as many as they can. First, you reach out to yourself. You reach out in every way to your own development. You know, we say seek knowledge, develop your qualities. 
You know, with evil qualities, you can never reach out to others. So develop your own qualities first. If you have jealousy, hatred, malice, all these dirty qualities, love of sin, the love of the world to the degree that you compromise your link with Allah just to achieve a little bit, all that we will never be able to be productive towards others. But once we have developed ourselves, we can reach out to many more. I was saying I know of people who every moment they have, they reach out to others. They're thinking of what to do. And I know of some others, their best friend is the duvet. The duvet. As soon as they get a free moment, they are sleeping. Why? Oh, the weather is like this. This is like that. The duvet, you know. When I was living in Saudi Arabia, there was a mattress called Sleep High. Sleep High. That was a brand. So, we're driving from Jeddah to Mecca and suddenly I saw a horse. And I saw it saying Sleep High. And the horse is, you know, like this. And I was new at the time and I'm looking, I said, I wonder what this is, sleep high. I mean, they're talking of weed or something. I, I, I don't know, sleep high. What's this all about? So I'm thinking of it and then I asked the driver, I said, you sleep high. What's this? He says, no, that's just a, a mattress. I said, oh, subhanallah. Imagine, sleep high. When I got to know some of my colleagues and friends, some of them were such that they really used to sleep high. You know, the level of sleep was very high. So from 24 hours, when we sleep 7, 8 hours, oh, some people would sleep 12 hours. They say, that's what is meant by sleep high. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who know how to rest. Rest is important. But too much of it, we lose productivity. We become addicted to sleep because we're lazy. And laziness overtakes us. So it's important by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us really to fight our own selves and then to be able to reach out to as many people as possible. Another very, very important point of productivity. Your country. Your nation. How did you reach out to your nation? Ask yourself the question. We said, how did you reach out to the masjid? How did you reach out to your community? You know when there are community uh, gatherings, some people will say, oh, these expats are getting together. The Sri Lankan expats are getting together. The Indian expats are getting together. The Pakistani expats are getting together. The Filipino expats are getting together. The, these expats are getting together. And by default, a lot of us will say, waste of time. Don't even bother going. But you don't realize, you need to go and make a positive change if you want something good to happen. The platform is already there. All you need to do is take a part, play a role. Because a leader who is productive will try to use a platform that is already there to make it productive because it is more difficult to create a whole new platform. Understand that. So if I have a function, for example, I will go. There might be one or two things I might not like. There might be a little bit of a waste of time. But I will make sure the input that I have made is such that it can change the whole outlook of that entire gathering and the purpose of it inshallah can become much more meaningful by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is productivity to be able to change things to look at your community what did you present your own community not only your own nationality but even the community you live in here one of the most diverse countries in the whole world with more than 200 nationalities brilliant the UAE what a gift of Allah what did you learn from others? Have you mixed with people from different cultures and learned the goodness that they have? Every culture has a lot of goodness, rich in goodness. Take the good. That which contradicts your deen, you can perhaps excuse it, but take the good. And this is why productivity entails that we make use of the gift of each individual that is unique to them in a way that they can be utilized for the holistic benefit of everyone. Someone is an expert for example, in cooking, well, make them the cook. Someone is an expert, for example, in, say, for example, he's an IT specialist. Well, make use of him in the community as well. And not such that you abuse the man or the woman, the brother or the sister, but rather you use them in a beautiful way. They feel like they are of help. And at the same time, we have achieved and benefited through their expertise by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's important also for us to have outreach programs. If you'd like to be productive, you need to reach out to the poor. You need to reach out to the orphans. You need to go visiting. You know, visiting our, the sickly is something very productive. They have a heart at the time that has a condition that is softer than the normal times when they were healthy. 
So whatever you say at that point, the good words you utter have a bigger impact on a person who is not so healthy anymore or who has gone through a health matter. Imagine, a lot of us might have been in hospital for a few days. Allah grant us all good health. I mean, may Allah grant cure to those who are sick and ill. I mean, when we were in hospital, you know how boring it becomes? It's one of the most boring environments because you just have to sit and wait. Some people, they are workaholics, they cannot rest. So they will do something and so on, no matter what. And then comes the nurse and the sister. No, you have to rest, you have to rest. Imagine if someone comes, short visit, power pack, telling you words that motivated you, shook you up, gave you a lot of hope and a lot of courage, and they went away. You're smiling. You're smiling for half an hour. You're thinking of it in the evening. You have so much hope. You feel half better because you know there are people out there who care for you. That's productivity. This is why the hadith of Muhammad gives so much importance to visiting the sickly. Go and visit the elderly. You'll get a page of wisdom from them. And remember when we visit, don't waste time. Some of you might have heard me saying in one of my talks when I was young, I visited one home with my mom. When I was quite young, I went with my mother to one of her friend's house, houses. And I remember distinctly on the door there was a sticker. And the sticker says, we are happy at your arrival, but we will be even happier when you depart. <laughs> I looked at it and I said, whoa, this is telling us not to waste time. So I was telling my mother, Ma, let's go, you know, let's go. She says, what are you such a big rush for? I said, I'll tell you later. <laughs> when I went home, I told her mom, there was a sticker on the door. Now that was my mistake. That sticker was just a joke, I think. But I told my mother, this was the sticker. It says, we are happy upon your arrival, but we will be even happier when you depart. My mother picked up the phone, phoned a friend. Hey, why didn't you tell me? Why did you have to just stick a sticker? Anyway, they sorted out that problem which I had created by relating it. But the truth is, the point we are learning is when you visit people, have a time limit. You don't go and sit. Today we have technology. Message them. Make sure they are comfortable with your visit. Because when a person is not comfortable with your visit, it is the most destructive visit you would ever have. No productivity in it. They are sitting there making dua, Ya Allah, make them go. Ya Allah, make them go. Oh, these people arrived, you know. It's like when you knock on the door and someone comes out and they say, my dad told me to tell you that he's not here. <laughs> then you know that this means I'm not supposed to have been here at all. Lack of productivity. We've got technology, phone them. I'd like to come. Is it convenient for me to visit you? They'll tell you, no, perhaps come tomorrow, come the next day. I'm not going to manage. Okay, so let's make it for next week. Okay, fine, no problem. You've agreed. And when we visit, you don't sit whole day that people want to sleep and you're still sitting there. No, go away. I would prefer to have a short visit in a way that they tell you, we want you to come back. And they really mean it. Then for them to say, oh, we can't wait for you to come back. But they're meaning, get out. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. We don't want that. So I'd rather ha have a short visit than to have a long one where they're sick and tired of me. The next time they see me from the intercom, from the video at the intercom, oh, this man, don't even answer the gate. Leave it. Everyone keep quiet. This attitude of hypocrisy is created because of our lack of productivity. We didn't think. So to think, to be courteous, to be polite, to be considerate. These are all qualities that will enhance the productivity of a person. More so if you're a Muslim. We are taught consideration when you're going to the masjid. Make sure you're looking okay. Make sure you're smelling good so that you do not become a means of destruction for the man next to you reading salah. The hadith speaks of a person who has eaten onions or garlic to wash their mouth thoroughly before they get to the masjid. Why? Because you don't want to become a person who results or who has resulted in the, the loss of productivity that a young man next to you had and he comes and says, you know, you're standing in salah and you're reading surat al and and your mouth is smelling so bad the man next to you is trying. <laughs> and you don't know what's happening but your mouth. The hadith tells you, wash your mouth. Imagine what type of consideration. Do you think Muhammad sallallahu would tell us something that was not productive? Never. So if he told us that, it shows consideration for other people. Be considerate. Look at their convenience. Look at what might hurt them, what might harm them. And so on. When we drive, we can be beautiful people who drive according to the laws. We don't have to be people who are hooligans, who give the wrong impression. Leave your soul interaction with a person on the road that you've had as the worst ever. I don't know about this country. I think... 
from what I notice, from what I gather, the laws are fulfilled quite well uh, on the road, I hope. I, that's what I noticed. But in other countries, subhanallah, you find a man darting, you know, from one end to the other. You look carefully and he looks like a Muslim. Oh no, man. It has happened. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us all and to grant us goodness. So we need inshallah to make sure that we have given as much as we can to society, to community, to our own people, to the various categories. Reach out to those who are oppressed as well. Support the oppressed. Don't run away from them because they need your help. If they don't get your help the day you need help, there will be none. Or if you were to reach out to them the day you need someone to reach out to you, there will be thousands. Thousands of people because they know this man, amazing. He used to reach out to everyone. He was a good man. Say good words. That's productive. Do you know every word you utter is an investment, opportunity. You either allow that investment to succeed or to flop. So you can choose your words in order to better the returns. Listen carefully. You can choose your words to better the returns. You know, in this country we talk business, big deal, mashallah. Everything is number one. So we thank Allah for that. The same applies, let your speech be number one. May Allah correct us. I mean, we are human beings. Sometimes we say things, you know, we are a little bit hard sometimes, but we need reminders. Before you speak, tell yourself, what I'm about to say will have a fruit. What I'm about to say will have a fruit. Will that fruit be a good fruit or a bad fruit? I'd like it to be something that will be beneficial, benefit others. So even in your own family, speak with respect, good words. That is so productive because your child will speak beautifully. Just because they heard you speak. You know when we speak slang, the children speak slang as well. Someone might say, well, what's the problem? The problem is, productivity is reduced due to colloquialness. Due to getting involved in slang. You know, when we are not professional, sometimes we discourage people from mixing with us, from coming to us, from wanting to have anything to do with us. So productivity is cut. But if you speak well in the home, to the people, everywhere, you are very, very uh, well spoken, well presented and so on. That is part of productivity. You feel good and automatically you present a picture. The others who mix with you, they feel good automatically. You're always smiling. A smile is so productive that it has been made an act of charity. You know, charitable deed means you're reaching out to people who need it. That's the meaning of the term charity. You are being charitable. So, I don't realize that I need people to smile at me. But when I smile, and I see others lighting up and smiling, and I feel good, then I realize the impact of it on my own emotion, and my own psychological condition at that particular time. Amazing. So you smile. You have a good look about yourself in the sense that give people a nice look. You know, to look someone in the eye when you're greeting them. It's part of the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You greet them properly. You know, some people half-hearted, they give you two fingers. It's like a gun. I, I shot you at the top and I shot you at the bottom. That's not how you're supposed to greet someone. You greet them for whole hand, mashallah, and you shake their hand properly. Assalamu alaikum, how are you my brother? Good, good things, mashallah. Don't ever go into details that make them feel like you're putting them in the corner and it embarrasses them. No, don't do that. You know, I have a habit. I don't like to ask people, brother, where are you working? What's your salary? Uh, how did you get the job? Is, uh, when was your last uh, you know, promotion? It's none of your business, my brother. When you start asking people too many questions and you start interfering in their lives, they feel uncomfortable. And what will happen? You have already cut a link with them from their hearts. They don't want to mix with you. Why? You ask too many questions. It happens with the brothers nowadays more than the sisters. There was a time a few years ago when they say that was a quality of the women. Now, no, 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 no. That's a quality of all of us. We have a habit. Sometimes we ask unnecessary questions. Brother, I had a man who told me, how much do you weigh? And I said, hey, come on, relax, man. How much do I weigh? What's the big deal? He says, no, you're a sheikh. A lot of the sheikhs are big. You know, I said, so what? You know, how much do I weigh? Why are you asking me the question? So if people ask you that which is irrelevant, 
you are distancing yourself from them and them from yourself. When you greet someone, Assalamu alaikum, how are you my brother? How's the family? What's going on? Mashallah, you might want to say one or two nice things. And that's it. You smiled at them and you went away. You've left an impact. Next time they meet you, they will greet you, my brother, how are you? But when you ask questions, they see you another time from a distance and they've gone through the other door. Why? Because, hey, that man, watch out. When he talks, oh, it's the, you won't hear the end of it. He's going to involve in your life negatively. So my brothers and sisters, we've spoken quite a bit. This topic we have, the productive Muslim, is such a vast topic that we've only touched on snippets of it. Everyone who talks of, of it will be able to talk about different aspects of it. Each one of us will have learned from our own experiences and we will be able to share our own examples. We will be able to share our own experiences. And this is why I invite you to go to Google and to search for productive Muslim and to go and find Abu Productive. There is a man known as Abu Productive or there is a Twitter page known as Abu Productive, a Facebook page as well, Abu Productive. Go and have a peek. Perhaps you might want to learn a thing or two from there. You will be able to benefit because so many people have said so many things about this topic. It's wrong for me to say, you know what, this is it. What have I left you with? Well, I've told you where to go, inshallah, by the will of Allah. It's not me, but it's someone who's doing productive work. We have to support it. So to support work that is productive is also part of pro being productive as a Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of us. May Allah grant us goodness. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdi. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayki.